Hello and welcome everybody to another U of Care podcast. My name is Oliver Grundman and I am very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Jenny Lowe Siganik to uh, one of our podcast uh, interviews. Uh, Dr. Lowe Siganik, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience? Sure. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Jenny Lowe Siganik. I'm an associate professor in the University of the Florida College of Pharmacy Department of Pharmaceutical Outcome and Policy. I'm also a member at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Safety, and also Center for Addiction Research and Education. So I'm a pharmacist and also pharmacoepidemiologist and a pharmaceutical health services researcher. I mainly apply um, the pharmacoepidemiology uh, approach to address relevant issues in clinical practice. Um, to improve the patient care and enhance the drug safety. Uh, the spectrum of faculty that we have at U of Care always fascinates me. And so you, like, like myself, are in the College of Pharmacy. And I understand that you recently received um, funding from uh, the National Institutes of Drug Abuse. Congratulations in the amount of uh, yeah. over five years, 3.2 million. Uh, what is this f funding about? What, what are you researching currently? Uh, sure. So my main research focus improving drug safety, medication adherence, pain management, and the quality of prescribing and the treatment for substance use disorders, especially among the vulnerable populations. So uh, most like uh, like Dr. Uh, Gondman uh, mentioned, um, just uh, in this month, I just received a, a grant, R1 grant, uh, funded by uh, NIDA, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, it's uh, to develop and ev evaluate the machine learning, opioid prediction, and the risk stratification e platform. We call demonstrate as an acronym. And the aim of the study is to harness advanced um, natural language processing and also neural network approaches, uh, more uh, machine learning AI approaches to build um, our previously developed machine learning prediction algorithms to identify patients at a risk for opioid overdose or opioid use disorders. So we are going to develop the clinical decision support tools that can be implemented in the e electronic health breakers uh, system and to help the clinicians to uh, identify who are patients are at a high risk of the overdose and opioid use disorders. So this is an uh, innovative um, and uh, integrated uh, clinical decision support tool. Um, the goal is to better guide the clinical providers and the healthcare system for improving safety of the opioid prescribing in clinical practice and also uh, prevent the opioid associated adverse outcome. It is fascinating. So artificial intelligence and machine learning are kind of a cutting edge uh, endeavor that UF is uh, currently involved with on a, on a large scale and kind of across all disciplines, but uh, especially in healthcare where we accumulate a large amount of electronic records across a patient's lifespan. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it just makes sense to look at potential risk factors or looking at what might potentially um, uh, trigger or what might be factors, contributing factors that may lead somebody to be at risk of an opioid use disorder or then even leading to, uh, to an overdose. Um, so what led you to uh, even look at, at this particular research, but getting into uh, this field of substance use disorders on, on this pharmacoepidemiological scale? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, I think um, I got my foot in the addiction research was uh, probably stemmed from my postdoctoral training at the Center for Pharmaceutical Policy and Prescribing at the University of Pittsburgh. 
So uh, as a postdoc, as a postdoc at that time, opioid crisis has brought a lot of tensions at that time. So um, I work uh, our the, the center uh, at the University of Pittsburgh work closely with the uh, Pennsylvania Medicaid. Um, the Department of Human Services, uh, Department of Human Services. So, as a postdoc, I conducted several studies using the Pennsylvania Medicaid administrative claims data to examine and understand opioid prescription opioid utilizations and the patterns of the medication use for opioid use disorder treatments in Medicaid population. Um, at that time, the goal was uh, to inform the policy intervention and uh, to improve the patient care. So after my 15-month postdoc training, I was in 2015. I transitioned to a faculty position at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy. Mm-hmm. So I started. Uh, shadowing and observing the care at a one uh, opioid treatment um, program clinic. So I think this really has a more real impact on me because I heard through that um, shadowing, I heard a lot of the stories from patients and some are really tragedy, tragic. And, and I realized this patient, this individuals with addictions uh, problem, they are really struggle and that they truly need more help uh, to improve their treatment because sometimes there's a stigma issues and there's a lot of the um, social economic issues and the, so they have they have to deal with a lot and the, um, if we consider diabetes a chronic disease and the, so the same thing for a patient with a, a individual with an addiction problem. So it takes a lot of the effort, and the issue is the complex. So it really need a, a, the multidisciplinary help, uh, the work collaboration in order to improve their care and treatment. So that's how I got interested in the field of the addiction research. I think it's it's fascinating how uh, you know from from a pharmacist perspective, uh, we often are the ones who actually in the end, fill the prescriptions and dispense them to patients when it comes to opioids, for example, and we try to make patients aware of how to take them and uh, how to be, be careful, you know, and, and, and you, you see how, uh, how often back in, in, the, in the 2000s to 2010s prescription opioids, often in high amounts, they were dispensed. And now how this has been dialed back because we saw how patients moved from uh, an opioid use that was a, a, a legitimate prescription use to an abuse or misuse and abuse. Um, now we see right. more and more of heroin and fentanyl increasing again. Do you think that right. um, your tool, uh, artificial intelligence machine learning, can inform uh, uh, healthcare providers and and patients alike, primarily healthcare providers and healthcare professionals, uh, to even curb and and bring down heroin and fentanyl uh, use, uh, not only prescription opioid abuse but also the heroin and fentanyl abuse. I think that's a that's a really great question, and also uh, as we all in the addiction research field, we all know this is a very complicated uh, situation. So uh, we rely we uh, we rely on the existing data to um, trying to come up the prediction algorithm which patients are um, uh, at a high risk. But I would uh, I would admit that relying on the just the healthcare data or clinic data may not be sufficient. Because as you say, uh, although uh, at the beginning, a lot of the heroin use or fentanyl use was originally stemmed from the prescription uh, opioid misuse, abuse, or uh, uh, misuse and abuse uh, from the prescription opioid. But 
because more restrict policy and everything, uh, the restriction on the policy or um, now prescriber might have more knowledge on the, this issue. So they are actually may not be that easy to get a prescription opioid. And that's why they are, it's easier to get from the street. So, um, so where can we get those data, uh, incorporate that information in our uh, prediction algorithm? It's always an um, a improving element in our, in our work. So although we don't have a, um, like a, the data, like a, which area or which patient is using heroin and or which patient is uh, buying the fentanyl from the street, we, we probably will never get this data, but we are trying very hard to get some additional data like a, as a proxy. For example, maybe we can incorporate some social determinants and the behavioral determinant of health from the clinical notes. Maybe the patient has some history of the suicide or child abuse that might be informative in the uh, prediction algorithm. Or maybe the area the patient lives in the past month has a peak in the like overdose from the heroin or fentanyl, and they might be also an informative uh, indicator from the geographic very geographic indicators. So we, although we don't have uh, the data exact what we want, but we try to identify link to the public available data with the more timely information as a proxy to try to um, try to uh, identify additional predictors. And in other in another our work, we also try to link the data to the court records or. Uh, the public, public services use um, um, the data. And all the goal is trying to identify additional information to help us to um, fill that missing piece, uh, like the information you say. So, yes, I mean, in a way, in, in, in the, at our point uh, of view, you know, we are trying to pr provide a um, primary care provider some tool or some guidance at a time when they are going to prescribe the opioid prescription to the patient. So uh, there are a lot of elements we can try to work with, like some are working with a community partner or some are working with the social workers, but this one is uh, we pick up the primary care provider as an initiation starting point uh, for, for us to work on. So I don't know if uh, I answered your question. I, I think it's not an easy question to answer, to be honest. I just uh, came up with it because we see this increase, this really massive yeah, rise in yeah. heroin and fentanyl because of more restrictive prescription opioid or prescribing of, of, of opioids. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, that makes one wonder, you know, how can such models uh, help healthcare providers also to, to tackle this issue? And I think because we saw this this move from prescription opioids to heroin and fentanyl then for folks, can we do something about that as well uh, to to curb uh, really where where things are moving at the yeah. moment? Uh, and I uh, yeah. I think it's a, it's definitely a, a complex issue. There are so many moving parts, as you said yourself, uh, and every every bit helps uh, that helps us to reduce the risk for individuals. Right, right. And also, I would like to echo your, uh, what you're saying. It's a complex, complicated issue. So, um, and uh, like, especially during the COVID, and we all see yeah. the overdose and uh, um, other mental health uh, issues can um, rise up again. So there are a lot of issues playing in the role here. But I would say, you know, uh, previously, a lot of people think uh, when they pay patient on the high dose of the uh, opioid, prescription opioid, and make them as high risk. But in our prediction algorithm, the high dose is just one of the factor contributes to, to the uh, risk. And uh, in, in this, in addiction world, it's so complex. So that's why machine learning or AI might play a role because uh, it can deal with the complex interaction between like a 
uh, prescription opioid use, pain, pain condition, mental health condition together to um, turn into a more uh, translational uh, information that we can use to for the target intervention. So as long as the patients seek for the health care or medical care, then we can have opportunity to uh, do some target intervention for them. Uh, but but uh, still, a lot of the some patients might not never see the seek for the health care. So that part is uh, also require more work and effort too. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think whenever you can help one, two, three, ten, twenty, one hundred, a thousand eventually, you know, as as your models get better in prediction and uh, obviously there is some adaptiveness. I assume that that as as your model gets better uh, in in predicting yeah. and and includes more factors, uh, as every model has to kind of learn and adapt to to the various factors yeah. and 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 conditions, uh, it, it's a it's definitely a, a very fascinating uh, and evolving. I think it's just so because they, there's so much information out there, and we as humans just cannot handle it any longer with just our yeah limited capacities uh, and, and these yeah. adaptive models are, are fascinating. Something that I will I will admit I, I have not much knowledge about. So and, and that's what what I think is, is so fascinating about it. It's uh, it's definitely so when, when you look at your current work and how you how you how you got from you know your, your the University of, of Pittsburgh and um, and and University of Arizona and now University of Florida through these mm -hmm. you know this your own kind of academic and um, evolution let's say it that way uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, that that the research community specifically uh, when it comes to substance use disorders um, and society as a whole are facing uh, uh, when it comes to substance use disorders and addiction? Yeah, thank you for, thank you for that question. So uh, like you say, you know, we are in the era of the big data. So the big data, I can probably use the 6D to describe the big data is in terms of the volume, the amount of data we receive, like either from the administrative plan data or electronic health record, it's a huge amount. And also the variety of the data is uh, very highly diverse, like imaging data and you know lab results and a variety type of the data and uh, require a high speed to process in this data and also re require the relia reliable methods and also some like a ver different type of approach might ha uh, handle the different type of data better. And uh, the end, what is the value of the, we are trying to do this? Is it to improve the patient care or improving the F efficiency in the, uh, pro in the process of the patient care? So these are making the machine learning and the, uh, um, the, or artificial intelligence might be a, a solution. Um, although it's not a, like a, um, it's, a, machine learning and AI are not a new ideas. It's a originally originated from the 1950s. So, so just because uh, the, we are encountered in the big data area, so there are a lot of the uh, challenges and the issues that we are actually encounter in the in, in my research uh, part. Let's say you know usually identify the issues or write the research question is the easiest part, but the second step is usually identify uh, data collection. So do we have a required data source and data accessibility and the reusability or uh, what's the preparation requirement? What kind of data we need? And as I say, in the like you you mentioned in the addiction world, um, a lot of times social and the behavior determinants of health data is really important. But sometimes we don't have uh, access to link all the like, for example, social work data or criminal justice or court records. And uh, because it has a high data privacy, and you need to maintain the 
security, confidentiality. This is a one big biggest challenge. And even you get the data, you know, successfully, and uh, what is the analytical data flow uh, you should use? More methods and the tool need to in integrate to uh, analyze this multi-type data, like I say, lab result imaging and or just a traditional pres prescription records. And how can we really improve or adjust the capacity across the different settings? When we develop the uh, algorithm from one state of the pencil, um, like for example, um, uh, Florida Medicaid program, can we apply or expand it to other states uh, or other healthcare systems? And even we use the machine learning to uh, develop some um, more fancy algorithm to improve the accuracy. But there's always a, a, a balance and a trade-off between the uh, explainability, interpretability, and the transparency and the accuracy. So do we care only care about the black box and about really, uh, you know, it's really accurate, but it's a black box. We couldn't see anything. Or do we want to see what's in there and we can um, interpret that? We, um, and that what is our goal? So that is the challenge when we try to develop the clinical decision support tools or apps. And even we develop something like a tool or algorithm, but there's always a decision making and communication in the at the end of the patient care and in the healthcare system, because you need to get a stakeholder engagement. There's a cause involving there. And there might be a potential unintended consequences. How about given the overdose is a rare outcome. So you are going to have a, a high false positive. So that means the patient, maybe they don't have a risk, but you told you predict them as a high risk and they might not receive the proper pain management as they should be when they have a, that flag on. So we really need to be careful on the potential unintended consequences to prevent the patient who really need a pain management but couldn't receive the uh, treatment. And right now, it's a really hot uh, topic right now in our field is also bias, equity, and the fairness issues. When you develop the machine learning algorithm, we really need to make sure our, uh, well, before we apply, make sure to mitigate the, uh, uh, there's any potential biases, make sure there's an equity when we deliver the intervention. And finally, the last challenge is that even everything you work out, all the issues I mentioned above, uh, above we overcome, there's a still a sustainability issue and the trustworthy and accountability and the legal issues involved in the in the addiction research or addiction uh, field. So um, it's a lot of the challenges, but uh, also make it um, make us feel uh, this is a very promising and exciting field uh, that we can really uh, do a lot of work to improve upon. Yeah. When you consider that folks are willing to basically layer, kind of lay their their life open on Facebook, and and share kind of every five minutes what they're doing, right? Uh, take pictures yeah. and uh, whatever they are doing on a daily basis, but then they remain very closed up when it comes to some other, even in a in a relatively secure environment sharing their information uh, because it wouldn't mm -hmm. be shared outside of that uh, relatively secured environment where you are basically with a healthcare yeah. provider that would not be shared anywhere else uh, in order right. to inform your model, in order to inform basically that data collection. It is, it is interesting mm -hmm. how uh, how we sometimes seem to be very willing to share information with the world uh, for sometimes also in, I mean, Facebook wants to advertise to you. That's why they want your information. Uh, and, and then we are not very willing to share information when it comes to our own health or to some other quite important things. 
uh, it, so it's kind of the the psyche of the human being is uh, a never ending and very fascinating topic for me personally, <laughs> but uh, yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> I know, I know. And that's why a lot of time people like to data mining the social media data. But like you say, because you can get some like a additional piece of information in more real time because you just... Uh, press post and then you can um, post on the Twitter. Well, I, I should take that back because I don't really use social media. So I don't know if one message is true. <laughs> and, and you don't even know if, if what they what is being posted there is necessarily true. Uh, some people may right. not post the whole truth, which is, I mean, it's fair. You don't have to uh, because you're not obligated to do that. So. It's, it's a fascinating time to live in and, and be a researcher on one side. Uh, and, and on mm -hmm. the other side, sometimes it can be quite frustrating, I would assume, to jump through some of these legal hoops and, and these policies that, that are there for a reason. I understand that they're there, but uh, it, it builds up barriers to, to providing the help that you want to provide to, to patients mm -hmm. and to, uh, to providers alike. Um, well, uh, Dr. Lo Siganik, this was fascinating, uh, and thank you so much for taking the time today to be with us. I really look forward to seeing what is coming out of your lab over the next years as you uh, as you engage with with your project, uh, but also mm -hmm. beyond that. Obviously, I I I think that your your project will have lots of impacts on uh, not only in the state of Florida, but beyond on a national level and internationally. Um, and I, I wish you nothing but luck and success in, in that endeavor. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, we are really excited for this work and uh, we hope we can share with uh, um, everybody uh, in, in, uh, in the next few years uh, what we have been uh, doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody for listening to today's podcast and watch out for the next uh, UF uh, Care podcast.